All right, everybody. Very warm welcome. The highest in me. Bows to the highest in you. So two days back, we had uh, a member of our community, uh, Arundhati, uh, pass away uh, quite suddenly. Um, she was uh, having breakfast with her son Siddhant and complained of some breathing trouble. And by the time he could even take her to the car, she had already collapsed and passed away. It was very quick. And uh, so obviously Siddhant is uh, uh, quite affected by that and he's uh, processing it. And I thought the best thing uh, I can do is to offer a session on uh, death uh, because uh, I've learned a few things around this topic that I found that at least were helpful for me and so I feel they might help us. And whenever Siddhant is in a position uh, to also go through this, he might also get something from the session if it's, uh, if it's suitable. So um, there are two parts to today's session. Uh, the one part is what I'm gonna call death contemplation. And the other part is uh, we'll do a death simulation. So we'll actually simulate what is it like to die, right? And uh, both are important. And it's not so much a teaching as it is a process of reflection. It's more, it's more about whatever I'm sharing is more about getting you to reflect and get in touch with your own deepest understanding. And I say deepest understanding because the superficial understanding is always going to be a very conditioned understanding. Whether we realize it or not, we have been conditioned in our responses to death. I, I saw this very clearly when I went to live in a different country, living in Thailand. And I was amazed to find that they have very different ways of relating to death than we do, for example, in India, right? And my teacher told this to me, he said, you know, much of our response to death is not an authentic response, it's a cultural response. We have a cultural pattern that wakes up. If you look at very young children and they're told that someone has died, they look very confused. They look as confusion and they look around and say, so what is it? Is that good news? And they look at you to decide if, and they, if they see you howling and crying, then they realize, oh, something bad has happened. They don't know something bad has happened. If you were to smile and celebrate and say, you know what, amazing, someone's died. Then they also start smiling and say, oh, someone's died. And they would learn that it's something to celebrate. But because we, they see us howling and crying. I remember once when I was young, then uh, some news came on the TV and my mother began crying loudly. What happened? Apparently, Indira Gandhi had been assassinated. And I was confused. Why is my mother, did my mother know Indira Gandhi? Why is she crying? <laughs> why, what is the, why is my mother crying about Indira Gandhi's assassination? Uh, but of course, she had an emotional reaction to that. And, uh, but these are like little, little moments, right? You say, oh, it's, it's bad news. It's bad news. Someone dying is bad news. So when I say get in touch with a deeper understanding, what I'm saying is get in touch with something that's true for you. Yeah, that may be how you've seen your parents respond or your people in your culture respond. But it's not the only way to respond. It's one way to respond. And believe it or not, there are cultures where death is celebrated literally celebrated. In fact, if you ask most, most people, would you like people to howl and cry when you die? Then most people will say, and you can answer for yourself, but most people say, why? No, no, celebrate. Most people would say, celebrate my life instead of crying about my loss. Celebrate who I was instead of feeling sad that I'm no longer there. I imagine at least most people would say that. And some cultures actually do that. Like in Sufism, they actually celebrate. They celebrate when someone dies. It's a party. It's party time. And you might have heard this beautiful quote that uh, when we came into the world, you know, everybody was laughing. We were crying. So let's learn to live in such a way. <laughs> and when it's time to go, we are the ones who are laughing. We are the ones who are smiling. 
and others can cry if they want. Right. So there's a there's a beautiful teaching in that. One of the ways of looking at spirituality is at the very least, at the very least, this is like base level, at the very least, die without regrets. And then you can go above that. You can die not only without regrets, but you can die with a positive sense of joy. You can... Because in, in some sense, uh, whether or not you're spiritual, we are, our whole life has been a preparation for that. Every single day, every single breath, I would say, has been a preparation for the last breath. Whether or not you've done some fancy spiritual practice doesn't matter. And I think just as when someone becomes a mother, their motherly instinct just wakes up and they just know how to hold the child. They just know how to feed the child. It's just The motherly instinct just wakes up. Right? When we are young, we go to school. A certain instinct to make friends just wakes up. Right? There's an instinct there. So I believe even as we approach death, death happens. There's an instinct. You may not realize it's there, but there's a deep instinct that will wake up and say, oh yeah, I know this one. I, I, I know what this is about. In fact, um, I made a list of certain things I wanted to share with you. This line came up. Oh, yes, I have waited for you my whole life. Oh, yes, I have waited for you my whole life. And how much nicer that is than, oh, no, I have feared you my whole life. Oh, yes, I have waited for you my whole life. Come. And I don't think it needs to be any more dramatic than falling asleep at night. You just relax into your, you know, how do you, like if you ask someone, how do you fall asleep? They'll say, what do you mean, how do you fall asleep? No, no, what's, what's the right way to fall asleep? No right way to fall asleep. You just lie down and just let go of all your worries and you fall asleep. Exactly. So that's pretty much it. You just let go of everything you're holding on to and you sink into, I like Eckhart Tolle's quote. He says, death is what separates us from everything that we are not. What a powerful teaching that is. Death is what separates us. Listen to that carefully. Death is what will separate you from everything that you are not, everything that you've been imagining yourself to be. And so in, in one perspective, it's a great separation, but from another perspective, it's a great reunion, isn't it? It's a reconnection. Separation and a reconnection, connecting to what's real, what's true. Ajahn Shah, my teacher Ajahn Shah used to say, if you have never contemplated death, your life will be very confusing. If you have never contemplated death, your life will be very confusing. So in other words, the more deeply you contemplate death, and this is, it's interesting because this is normally considered a morbid topic, considered a heavy topic. Like, well, why are we talking about such things? In fact, most cultures will quickly get, you know, they don't want to be around death too much. Quickly, let's cremate the body. Quickly, let's bury the body. In the West, they do this funny thing of doing makeup on the body. <laughs> Undertakers who will literally do makeup. They will they will make the body look all plump and nice. And they will, they, they, the whole art, you know, of looking, because it, over there, they they see the face of the dead one. Yeah, we stuff the nose and everything. We, <laughs> it doesn't look so nice. But there, they actually make it look quite presentable. They're going to have to come and pay their respect. Yeah. And uh, so this is, uh, like you had one chance, your whole life you've been denying death. Now you had one chance to finally confront it in just the way it is, right? Just the way the person looks, just the way... Uh, it is. But even there, we want to quickly just cover it up, make up. So if you've never contemplated death, your life will be very confusing. So I'll tell you my experience. When I went to um, my monastery in Thailand, I was surprised to find this big emphasis on death meditation. I was like, okay, so why? You know, I was quite young. I was in my early 20s. And I couldn't understand that my teacher would really emphasize contemplate death, contemplate death. In fact, I remember in the first month of going there, maybe first two months of going there, they took us to a hospital visit where there was an autopsy conducted. 
So we got to actually see, because, you know, every city has unclaimed bodies or sometimes people who die in suspicious circumstances. So all these bodies end up at a particular hospital. And there is an autopsy. Either it's done for the police reasons or it's done for medical reasons. The, the young doctors have to learn about the body. So if you take permission, it's actually possible to go and witness that. So I was, I was, I got to see a body being, there was a man, he must have been in his thirties. Maybe he was a alcoholic or we don't know what, but he was dead. And so it was just to see the process of uh, autopsy being conducted, very sobering. Say, okay, this is the fate of all our bodies sooner or later. Right. It's just going to be lying there like a hump of, uh, like, like this lump of clay or a lump of meat. And, uh, so these are contemplations. So my teacher really emphasized this. I couldn't understand what is, what is that about? But as I began doing it, I was surprised to find it was the opposite of depressing. Normally you would imagine thinking like that makes you very depressed, it's like anti-life. But funnily enough, my experience was that reality sets you free. Illusion keeps you in bondage. Reality sets you free. Your fantasy about who you are and how you how things will last forever, that fantasy is what binds you, not reality. Reality sets you free. So as I began to come to terms with my own mortality, there was a certain, every moment, like this moment, for example, I was, you know, I was looking for a photograph of Arundhati to put in our group. And then I finally found one. I'm like, none of us knew this would be the photograph, right? <laughs> none of us knew this would be like, for example, when you pop up. Do you know which your which which of your photographs will be chosen? You probably don't know, right? They're, your relatives will choose that. Unless you're a very super perfectionistic person, the year photograph is a <laughs> You don't know that. So when that photograph was taken, you did not know that's going to be the photograph. right? You did not know that. You just took the photograph happily. You had no idea that's going to be the one that's going to be hanging. Right? <laughs> what some one of you posted this video on our group that Jeevan hai to prem se jilo. To baad mein to frame mein rehna hai. <laughs> I'm going to be in a frame after that. So we don't know which interaction is going to be the last interaction. One of the last messages she sent to me was about posting. Can I share some? I'm, she said, I'm creating something. Can I share that in our group? I said, yeah, please go ahead and share it. So, and I did not know. She did not know that would be the last message. So we don't know. This could be the last time we meet. There's no guarantee. Right. Any meeting, and which is why if you treat it as a holy encounter, you don't know which meeting is the first, which meeting is the last. Meetings end in parting. We don't know which meeting will be the last meeting. But of course, at a deeper level, <clears throat> there is no parting because have you noticed that, for example, when people die, they are far more in our consciousness. Have you noticed? Like some of you who knew Arundhati, you probably you thought about her much more in the last few days than you have otherwise. If you went, not every, not all of you knew her, but those of you who did. Right. Chances are you thought about her a lot more. So it's funny that they're not there, but in a way they're more there. This is one of those strange things. And one thing I learned from Byron Katie, she was working with uh, someone who was, who was in a lot of grief about their uh, mother passing away. And uh, she said, okay, at home, was there ever a time where you were in your room and your mother was in another room? She said, of course, there were many times. I was in my room, my mother. So, so then could you see your mother? I couldn't see my mother. Could you hear your mother? I couldn't hear my mother. So why were you not in grief? No, no, I know I knew she's there. I knew she's in the house. Oh, you had a thought she's there. And that's what kept you okay. So now what's bothering you? You can't see her, you can't hear her, but there's a thought she's not there. Oh, the thought is what's hurting. The thought is what's hurting. It's not it's not the fact that's hurting, because we have 
like how many of you even right now as wherever you're sitting listening to this are all your loved ones here in the room right now chances are they're not maybe one or two are there but chances are most of your loved ones are not there but are you in grief right now why well, you should be in grief now you can't see them you can't hear them you don't know what's going on you don't know what's going on actually you don't know they're alive or dead actually you're imagining so how come you're okay you're okay because the thought and you say oh they're okay they're there they're in the other room or they're in the other town or they're in the other country but they're there i can reach them i can call them so what actually hurts is the thought they're not there i can't reach them i can't call them i can't hold them i can't talk to them i can't listen that's what really hurts a certain finality to it it's very powerful to realize it's the yeah finality yeah that's a thought isn't it that's a thought the thought that i will never be able to see them again when actually you're seeing them all the time you're thinking of them all the time you're thinking of them much more than usual chances are you'll put their pictures all over the place you'll put their wallpaper on your phone when someone dies they change all their pictures on whatsapp and facebook and everything they change it to that person's face sometimes so then that becomes so in a way you're seeing them more isn't it so what i learned in this process is that death is neutral actually death is neither positive nor negative that just is it's like breathing no you think of it as tragic but is it really tragic it's tragic when it happens to someone you love otherwise we are all reading in the papers every day and i mean come on <laughs> i mean every day look at the news you know people died here people died there none of us have an emotional reaction we have an emotional reaction when it's someone we know someone we are close to and we should really this is not a small thing you should really look at this closely how come you don't have an emotional reaction to death only to the death of someone that you know someone that you love is death the culprit or is it your way of thinking that's the culprit look at it carefully So one thing I've learned from Byron Katie is to question my assumptions. Is it true? Am I sure it's true? What happens when I believe that thought? Who am I without that thought? I like the way she says, "Death has such a terrible reputation." I think Death forgot to hire a PR department. <laughs> Very bad reputation. no one's managed death reputation but a very bad reputation but if you ever like there was a phase in my life where i was very deeply studying something called nde near death experience and if you ever go or just even if you just do a, even a simple google search nde near death you'll find people it's surprisingly common research says approximately one in every 100 people has had an nde chances are even in a group as big as this one of you may have had an nde near death experience So what do these people say when they come back when they almost die and they come back right sometimes literally the heart stops and they come back so they all come back saying it's blissful on the other side it's filled with light it's filled with beauty it's so peaceful there and surprisingly on the other side nobody wants to come back you would have thought that oh i'm a mother i've got two young children oh people are dependent on me no on the other side nobody then that's there's for whatever reason they're sent back kicking screaming you know your time is not done go back so i find i found it very fascinating that from here it seems like you know or a famous dialogue in the movies when whenever someone is going to kill someone don't kill me i have a family i have got children <laughs> the common dialogue but on in nde they tell you that on the other side it doesn't matter how the people are dependent on you or not no one thinks like that no one says send me back they all say i'm fine here but then sometimes they send back so the surprising thing is in actuality even if you talk to the and not all of these people by the way are spiritual people or just people some of them are even scientists and some of them are brain scientists so they actually have very interesting books they've written you know when they come back that you know oh i never believed in all of this or i was skeptical of all of this and and there's a certain pattern of course no nd is is exactly the same but there's a certain pattern that follows if you if you read the books a certain pattern of similar experiences 
and some of them have all the experiences some of them have some of them but usually it is some combination of you, you know you heard that phrase that your life flashes before your eyes have you sometimes done a fast forward on netflix one scene after the other goes so it's something like that your entire life flashes before your eyes but not just so the interesting thing it doesn't just happen unidirectionally of you know you playing back what you saw it happens multidimensionally what does it mean not only do you see and feel what happened you see and feel feel what everyone around you felt so when you were kind and you touched people's hearts there's an explosion of bliss and when you were mean and you hurt many people around you it's like you're in hell because you're not only experiencing what you went through you're experiencing what everyone around you went through that's what they say at least so it's like a you're not just having a normal movie experience you're having an immersion experience and so this is one of the things they claim you have a kind of a flash you see your whole life in front of your eyes and then typically there's some kind of a light that you're drawn to and then either you see some angelic figure or you see some you see your grandmother grandfather sometimes you even meet your old pet some loving figure welcomes you typically and then they guide you from there and you know they discuss you know what was it like and it's one thing that's always there is it's a, it's an atmosphere of absolute non judgment in fact the funny thing is the only one judging you is not some god or not some yamraj guess who's judging you i think you know the answer you're judging you you are sitting there and judging you nobody else is judging you everybody else is like chill it's okay <laughs> but you're judging yourself oh i should have i could have why didn't i more of less of so uh death has a bad reputation so for all you know it's not as bad as we imagine and so my teacher said contemplate death contemplate it frequently i lived in a monastery where there was cremations happening we would have every month or sometimes more than once a month someone would die and in thailand they have open cremations so in india we cover the body with wood in thailand the body is kept on top of the wood so you can actually see very clearly what's the body not hidden you can actually see very clearly the whole process of the body burning and it's a very powerful uh, experience to see that literally the skin and all the bone and both the, the muscle and the nerves and everything is burning right there in front of you it's a very sobering thing that okay that's the fate right they say ashes to ashes so my body is made of elements it is sustained by elements every day you put elements into your body you eat breakfast lunch and dinner that's basically the elements you can say it's poha or rice or chapati but actually you're putting elements into your body you're putting earth element into your body water element into your body right the heat rice is cold can you heat it up my tea is cold can you heat what that heat element you're putting heat element into your body you're putting elements into your body earth water fire air and space sustained by elements and returning to elements so it comes from elements it is sustained by elements it returns to elements that is the fate of the body so then recognize that contemplate that i was surprised when i discovered i didn't know this when i discovered that the salt that you and i eat are the fossils of ancient sea animals you know you we all like salt in our food well then you are celebrating death what is death because the salt is is the is the bones and the ashes not the ashes but the bones the residue of ancient sea creatures it took enormous death for your food to be tasty so it's totally embedded when you start looking at it like this you realize life and death are not white and black they're completely intertwined the petrol that we use in our cars are liquefied trees from ancient times so it's death the death of a forest right so i want to now share with you a few ways that might be might be skillful ways and this is more not so much to teach you again it's more for you to trigger into your mind what would be a skillful way to approach a death so i'm going to share a few and then after that we're going to get into a death simulation and as i'm speaking i'll pause so if you feel like writing something or i trigger some thought in you then make a note of that if you want to 
going to pause between the things I say. My friend's mother, Pami Aunty, died a few years back. And uh, I knew her as someone who really lived loving kindness, Metta Bhavana, loving kindness. Her whole life, she was a loving presence, caring presence. And she went through her own husband's passing and her own cancer. And the very last day of her life, I got to, I was not in Pune, but I got to speak to her on the phone. And I could see that even in that last stage, she's very graceful. She I literally spoke to her hours before she passed away. And she was quite coherent, quite conscious. Uh, not speaking much, but yeah, listening, understanding everything. So one of the ways is loving kindness. Practice loving kindness. The Buddha actually says this. When you practice loving kindness, you die an unconfused death. So come to a come to a recognition of loving kindness, metta bhavana, or like Byron Katie says, loving what is. Loving the state of your body. Loving the state of your emotions. Loving the state of your mind. Loving whatever has been, whatever is, and whatever will be. Loving what is. Which actually means letting things be. When you love someone, you let them be. When you judge someone, you try to interfere with them. You love them, you let them be. Then the other practice is loving kindness. Along with loving kindness, the other practice is breath meditation, anapanasati. And it simply means to be aware of the in-breath, to be aware of the out-breath. In-breath could be long or short, rough or smooth. Out-breath could be long or short, rough or smooth. Just to be aware, oh, in-breath, oh, out-breath. And the Buddha gives an assurance that those who have practiced anapanasati, breath meditation, awareness of the in and out breaths, are aware of their very last in and out breath. This practice comes back to you at that time. And I have friends who have been in a near-death situation who have been meditators. And they've told me, Nitya, I was driving. My car skid off the road. It went toppling. Airbags came on. Seatbelt got tight. I forgot every other thought. I just came back to my breath. And I never knew which would be the last breath. I was just breathing in. The car is tossing and turning. Airbags are on. Madness is happening. The mind just came to the breath. All right, this could be the last breath. In, out. In, out. And it so happened that they survived. But it was fascinating to them that, oh, it's true what the Buddha said. My mind came to the breath. Automatically, it came to the breath. There was nothing I could do there. The car had to just settle down by itself. And yes, I was bruised and everything, but I was amazed how my mind came to the breath in those last moments of what seemed like the last moments of life.
somebody asked Eckhart Tolle, he gave them a, somebody gave Eckhart Tolle a brochure of a retreat center and said that there's so many workshops here. I don't know which one to attend. Can you help me? So he went through the retreat brochure, this meditation center, so many different courses, so many different offerings. And he said, they're all good. You can attend any of them. But let me tell you something that's better. It wouldn't even cost you anything. What's that? Any time in the day when you're not doing anything, bring your mind back to your breath. Feel the in-breath. Feel the out-breath. This, if you do this for one year, and whenever nothing else is happening, just come back to your breath. Feel the in-breath, feel the out-breath. He said, this will give you more benefits than attending any retreat. What a beautiful teaching. Right? And he's not even saying meditate for 15 minutes in the morning and evening. He's just saying throughout the day, whenever there's nothing else happening, come back to yourself. Come back to the breath. Feel the breath. Stay with the breath. This will benefit you more than any retreat. So mindfulness of breath is another great way. And death actually, uh, breath actually includes death contemplation. Why? Because it, it includes arising and passing, beginning and ending, right? So right there, you can see, oh, they're the, they're, the, they're the beginning, they're the fading. They're the beginning, they're the fading. Ah, this is the nature of life. Comes and goes, comes and goes. And the thing about breath is, you can't get too excited about breath. I mean, breath is just breath, right? Just like you can't get too excited about drinking water. Okay, if you're very thirsty, you'll get excited about it. But normally, water is just water. So breath is just breath. So there's no strong emotional attachment that, oh, breath. It's so neutral, right? So you, it's a good way to come to neutrality, which means equanimity, which means balance of mind. The next one is impermanence, anicca, impermanence. So feel the impermanence. Don't just think about impermanence, feel the impermanence. So feeling your breath is one way to feel impermanence. But any kind of like, in my case, I normally experience impermanence of feelings, sensations, right? Can you feel that now? Noticing arising and passing. Could be at the ear sense door, like you're hearing these, vo these words come and go. Could be at the eye sense door, you're noticing some kind of movement, some kind of change on the eye sense door. Could be the breath. And the one that's always available is feelings. Because even if your eyes are closed, even if there's no sound, feelings are always going on. Heart is beating. There's some sensation in the body. And if you can tune yourself to focus less on the content and more on the characteristic, content will be preferred or not preferred. Liked or disliked, always, right? That's true for all of us. You like it, you don't like it. You want it, you don't want it. That's content. But characteristic. What is characteristic? Changing. This is very powerful. Can you defocus from content and focus on characteristic? Now you've gotten in touch with something universal. Because the characteristic of any content is impermanent. So again, you won't get you won't get overpowered in the presence of death. Your mind will remain balanced, impermanent, impermanent. And the Buddha gives a guarantee that anyone who dies 
with awareness of impermanence. It is impossible for you to go into a lower realm if you have that concept of uh, reincarnation or rebirth. Because other beings less than human cannot cannot experience impermanence. It's not it's not within their capacity to perceive impermanence. They'll perceive things but not impermanence. They don't have that capacity. So you'll always be reborn, human and above. And if you you might you might just get liberated. We'll come to how to get liberated. Quite simple actually. You're only reborn because you feel that unfinished business. Something is not done. I need to experience something. There's something I still haven't experienced. There's something I want to experience again. There's something I want to do all over again. I want to do it better next time. I want more of this or more of that. I want more beauty next time. I want more power next time. I want more money next time. I want to be loved. I want to be famous next time. Fame will do it for me. Money will do it for me. Being learned will do it for me. Being influential will do it for me. Well, whatever game we play in our current life, that same game will go on, right? We keep imagining, oh, that will do it for me. But if you can see through that and realize that really, is it true? Is it true that more of something will do it for me? If you can see through that, then you will not be drawn to anything. Just like when you've eaten a full meal, then we can offer you the best food in the world and you will smile and say, thanks. But this is the best food in the world. This is the most expensive food in the world, most tasty food. And you're going to say, thanks, right now I'm full. So Hindi mein bada acha shabd hai, tript. When you're tript, you know, a sense of fulfilled, complete. I don't think there's a matching word in English, really. Tript. So if you're really that tript, that complete, fully satiated, then what can attract you? Nothing can attract you. Man. But to the extent you're thirsty and hungry, then you'll go on the search. And that search goes on and on and on. And it's a very deceptive search because it keeps promising the next thing will do it, the next thing will do it. Just like until now our life, this is what's happened, right? How many desires you had and how many of them have been fulfilled? And has that ended desire? Chances are it hasn't. There's still more. So the other one is no wanting or craving of any kind whatsoever. Try this right now. Can you give yourself a minute or two or even a second or two of no wanting or craving of any kind whatsoever? And there may still be a you know, desire to breathe, for example, but that's just happening naturally. You're not forcing it. So breath is happening naturally. But upon, you're not adding to it. There's no additional wanting or desire or craving of any kind whatsoever. So see what happens. Chances are there is a simplicity here. There's a clarity here. Chances are there's a stability here. 
there is a sanity here. So this is a great perception to practice. If you practice this perception of dropping all your wants, hopes, desires, cravings, even momentarily, then this will be available to you. And then you cannot get seduced into another womb of any kind. Because there's no, it's like trying to use a magnet on plastic. There's no magnetism in plastic. <laughs> What's going to draw you? So it can't seduce you into another womb. The Tibetans have this interesting teaching. They say, at a certain stage in your practice, you're not reborn because of karma. You're reborn because of karuna. How amazing. So you're no longer being pushed So they can actually, they write poems and they say, okay, look for me in that village two months from now. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> look for me in that village two months from now. All right. Now that's a whole other level. Right? You've made this whole thing into a game now. Coming and going as you please. But not out of compulsion but with an intention. May I be a channel of blessing. May I be a channel of blessing. In a way, you don't go anywhere. Like, are, are you noticing? I'm I'm sitting here. I'm not going anywhere. And yet I'm appearing in all these different places, in all your homes. How come? I, I, I haven't come to your home right now. So they have a nice word for this emanation. Emanation. Not moving and yet reaching everywhere. So this is the it's a, it's a phenomenal idea that you're no longer trapped in a body and mind. The body and mind is just a screen. It's like I'm appearing on your screen right now. The body and mind is just a screen through which something emanates. So no longer afraid of it then. It's a, it's a big game now. I think I'll do one more before we get into our simulation, which is surrender. Surrender to the totality. Surrender is you just trust, just like a child will hold mother or father's hand and just trust, okay, take me. Take me to school or take me to wherever you need to take me. Just trust, hold your father or mother's hand and just allow yourself to be led. Right. So this is the this is the act of surrender, trusting, trusting, deeply trusting. What got me here will take me home. Just like you were held in your mother's womb and you were brought into this world. This world is a bigger womb from this perspective. Your mother's womb was a small womb. This world is a bigger womb. And death is yet another kind of birth, being born outside of this womb. Just like when you're in your mother's womb, you might have been hesitated, okay, now what's going on? What, 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 where am I going? It's like, it's like dying, right? What we call birth is for, the child, for that infant, it's dying, isn't it? They're dying to their whole reality, their whole reality with that little bubble. Look at it from the perspective of the infant. It's death, but for us, it's birth. 
So how can you be sure that what we call death is also not a kind of birth, if this is also a larger womb? So how can we be sure that's not a kind of birth? So surrender, trust. Certain intelligence brought you here, that same intelligence will guide you back. Nothing to be so concerned about. I'll tell you this much that at least since I, I think since the age of 16, 17, I've been involved in call it meditation or self-inquiry or whatever. Everyone that I have seen who has passed away has had a very clean death. No very uh, complicated deaths, very clean, very clean. So I foresee each one of you also having a very clean death. Clean, no, no complications, no troubles, just clean. I had a person attend my retreat and uh, I think a few months later, he was sitting at home watching TV and he asked his wife to get some water. So she went to the kitchen. When she came back, he died. Literally in that one minute. So can you get me some water? He, she went to the kitchen. He comes back a minute later with the water. He passed away. He's just in, on, lying on the, on, on the couch. It's gone. That, that's sweet. That's clean. I had a meditation teacher. Uh, she went for a Vipassana course. And those of you who done a Vipassana course, in the evening, there is a, a meditation from 6 to 7 in the evening. And then Goenkaji says, Bhavatu Sabha Mangalam, which is like, may all beings be happy. And their typical answer, everyone responds, Sadhu, 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 bow down. So she also responded, but she said it in a very slow way. So much longer, Sadhu, much longer than others, Sadhu. And then she bowed down. And people get up and they got up, went to the restroom, whatever. And they noticed that she's still down. So after a minute or two, someone went to check on her. Are you okay? She passed away. Oh, that's a cool way to pass away. You finish an hour of meditation. <laughs> Your teacher says, may all beings be happy. You also say, you respond to that, may it be so, may it be so. Sadhu, sadhu means may it be so. Sathastu. And you bow down. And that's it. That's your last uh, action. So these are just some examples. I know many more. But uh, this gives me confidence that uh, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. It'll be fine. And outwardly, no one can really tell, but inwardly, you'll be okay. Outwardly, it may still look like, oh, you're, you know, you're a little bit breathless or this or that. But inwardly, you'll be like, all right, it's fine. You'll be stable on the inside. I, I have that uh, confidence. So now we'll do a death simulation. So what this means is that five minutes from now, you're all gonna die. Five minutes from now, you're all gonna die. And uh, yeah, sorry to inform you. You may have had plans for the day, but uh, I think death doesn't care about your plans. So five minutes from now, you're going to die. So now what begins? Something begins in you. And chances are a deep process of letting go begins in you. Oh. So I want you to use the phrase, I am dying to. I am dying to. So for example, I'll give you a few examples. I'm dying to my plans. I'm dying to my hopes. I'm dying to the image I have of myself.
I'm dying to my attachments. And continue doing this. And if some of you feel like putting it in the chat, then I might read out some of what you're saying. You're dying to, what are you dying to? Put it in the chat. And some of them I'll read out. You don't even have to write it down. You can just feel it. I'm dying to fill in the blanks. Because now you only have four minutes left in this world. What do you need to come to terms with? Dying to my desires. Dying to everything I hold on tight to. Dying to my judgment. Dying to my fears. Specifically, I'm dying to my fear of death. I'm dying to all my expectations. Dying to my creativity and even my spirituality. Dying to my fear of leaving my child behind. Dying to all the things I've wanted to and have not wanted to do in my life. Dying to unfinished business. Dying to my conditioning. Dying to all my ideas about death. Dying to my fear of discomfort, fear of the unknown. Dying to all the books that have yet to be read. and the guilt of having not read them. I'm dying to striving for enlightenment. I 
And now you can stop writing because you just have one minute left in this life. So now prepare your consciousness for the last minute. Empty yourself. the last 10 seconds of this life. Last out breath. And just be normal, breathe normal. It was a simulation. Turns out it's not your time yet. But something happened here. Some recognition came, some clarity came, some insight came. some sense of what's important and what's not important came. Some refinement happened. So fill in the blanks for the new reality I'm stepping in is for example, the new reality I'm stepping in is enjoying each moment just the way it is. The new reality I'm stepping in is judging less, appreciating more. And give me a few more examples if you like in the chat. The new reality I'm stepping in is, and you can fill in the blanks in the chat if you want to. Otherwise, just do it for yourself. What's the new reality you're stepping into? living fully just this moment. The new reality I'm stepping into is rule number six. Don't take life so seriously. Remember to smile, remember to laugh. The new reality I'm stepping into is just be, just be. The new reality I'm stepping into is gratitude for every moment. The new reality I'm stepping into is awesomeness and blissfulness.
<laughs> the new reality is to treat everyone like God in drag, like costume. <laughs> Love everyone. Like they're God and clever, this guy. In my new reality, I accept myself and others as we are. As we are. I accept everything is coming to you. In this new reality, I enjoy the neutrality of both life and death. And so it is. And so it is. And so it is. In today's practice, I shared with you a few different ways we can look at death, we can contemplate death, a few different perspectives on death, shared with you how different cultures look at death. And mostly I invited you to look deeper beyond what you're told, beyond what you're told by culture, by religion, even by spirituality, even by people like me. Look beyond that. Who are you beyond these stories? What's your own direct intuition? Check. And then toward the end, we also did a small death simulation where we said, okay, I'm dying. I'm dying to this, I'm dying to that. And literally doing a little dress rehearsal. Maybe the better word is undress rehearsal. We're undressing ourselves layer by layer <laughs> and uh, dropping everything and then stepping into the new reality. So the Buddha says, do this frequently, do this often. Don't do this once a year. Do this frequently, do this often. This is the real preparation. How much you prepare for a simple party, a simple trip to another city. How much you prepare? How many days? Some of you start packing one week before. You think of every last thing down to the mosquito spray. But uh, what about the big, big trip that we all have to definitely make? What about that big trip? So this is how you prepare for the big trip. And my my wish for you is uh, you will not be caught un you will not be caught caught unprepared. You will not be caught surprised. You will look death in the eyes and say yes. I've been waiting for you my whole life. Come. <laughs> There was a little sweet practice we did as monks. Every day we would share, it's called Punya Vitram, right? So we would share our merits. There's actually a nice Pali saying, that there's a chant for it. But basically you share your merits with all beings. Forward, backward, left, right. Men and women, good men and women, bad men and women. Like virtuous, non-virtuous. Uh, the rulers of the world, the kings, the, the nowadays you'll say presidents, prime ministers of the world. And interestingly, in, in that list, you also share your merits with Yama. Ujama, Lord of Death. So with that practice, what happened over the time as I did that practice, every night we do this practice, is I began feeling Yama is my friend. The sense that, oh, you know, it's normally in movies that your Yamaraj comes, it's a horrible, scary thing. I had a friend that Yama is my friend. So whenever Yama comes, he'll say, yeah, you know, yeah. thanks for sharing merits with me throughout your life. And the chances are he'll either send, send his best people or he'll himself come. And he'll say, come, ride with me. Let's let's make this sweet. So what I what I whether there's yama or not, but you know what's happening? You're changing your story. You're sh you're shifting from a sense of death is my adversary, death is my you know, is taking snatching me away from everything I love. But death is my friend. Death is my friend, and that's a very powerful perception when you have a sense that death is my friend. And death will, it'll be sweet, it'll be smooth, it'll be clean, and it will be. And that's my wish for all of you. And so it is. And so it is.